What's up, guys? This is Ryan from Elevate Cyber with another episode of What You Need to Know for OSCP. This time, we are covering Burp Suite. Now, don't worry. This is the community edition, so don't worry about any of this stuff over here that's pro only. We're going to be covering uh, the community edition, the one that you get for free out of the box with Kali Linux. And if you're doing uh, OSCP with the PWK course, uh, the VM they give you also has the community edition. So we're on board there. Now, one thing I will say is Burp Suite is the Swiss army knife of uh, web application pen testing, probably pretty much like one of the industry standards. It can do so much. We're not going to worry about most of what it can do. We're just going to worry about the bare bones minimum, what you need to know for OSCP. Because um, to be honest, you know, I'm a web app pen tester mostly. Well, I, I test more than web apps on the job, but a lot of what I do is web app. And I would say that is one of my strongest suits. Um, one of my strongest areas, if you will. And because of that, um, you know, on the job, I would be using a lot more of this stuff and even uh, a lot of extensions as well. You know, as the OSCP is a lot broader in its scope, um, you know, it, it covers a lot more than just web app pen testing. There's a lot of network uh, pen testing that you're going to be doing there. There is, you know, like binary exploitation a little bit, like your buffer overflows, and it covers a, a lot wider scope. And so... On the OSCP, you're not going to need to do any kind of crazy web exploitation. It's going to always be uh, kind of confined to the the big staple vulnerabilities, you know, the flagship ones, if you will. So we're going to just be, you know, covering it in this context, right? This is what you need to know for OSCP. So let's get right into it. Uh, you don't really need to use anything in the dashboard tab here on the community edition. Moving along to uh, the target tab, uh, one thing you can do is define a target. So say you don't want to log traffic outside of what you're testing, you can just add this to scope. And it'll give you a little pop-up here saying that uh, you've added this item to the scope. Uh, do you want it to send out of scope items to the history? If you answer yes, basically it'll, it'll only... Uh, It'll only log traffic to what you have in scope, in this case, just this site. So that can be handy. Not really too essential, but pretty nice to have, right? And you can see your scope here. You can edit it there, add stuff, remove stuff, whatever you want to do. That's pretty much all you need for the target tab, I would say. A lot of what you're going to be doing is in this proxy tab. So I've already went ahead and recorded some traffic. So basically the way I did that is I'm running uh, an extension called Foxy Proxy. And basically, it makes it easier for me to set up my proxy. So here, uh, I just set it up for Burp Suite. So I have um, my uh, loopback, my local IP 127.0.0.1, port 8080, because that's what Burp Suite listens to uh, by default. It's listening on that port. So if you want to set it up to work out of the box, just uh, create that. And, uh, you know, proxy type HTTP. And now, when I have this enabled, if I turn this off, it will it won't uh, proxy any of my traffic through Burp. But if I turn it on, it's as simple as that toggle on, toggle off. And now everything that I do will be tracked. So, for example, I click here. See that request just came in? And uh, now I can see the request. I can see the response. Um, have all that at my fingertips, right? So... Your HTTP history is just that, a history of all the requests uh, that you made and the, uh, the the response that goes along with them, of course. Um, you also have WebSockets here, but mostly you're going to be using uh, HTTP history. Uh, here in the options, you can see, like, by default, it's listening on 8080, like I said. You could change that if you want, but there's probably not going to be any reason to. And you, there's all kinds of fancy stuff you can do here. I'm not really going to get into that. I want to keep it... Uh, condense down here. So what you can do from here, say you have a request you want to tinker with it. You're going to need to do this a lot in OSCP. Uh, I'm trying to think here. We had a, a login here, right? We tried this username and password, and uh, it, it didn't like it. But if we wanted to maybe try some different passwords, we could do a control R and then send this to the repeater, or we could do control I and send it to the intruder uh, for some fuzzing. So if we go ahead into the 
And we'll cover the repeater first, right? So the repeater does what you know the name suggests, allows you to repeat the request. So if I send that, um, I can see what's going on with this here. And uh, in this case, let's see a 303. That's kind of interesting. Let me see what I was getting with that. So let's say we just do admin admin or admin admin password. We'll try that. Okay, and that was the error message there. If I go back here, let's just take this one, send this one to repeater, and replay this. And yeah, I guess yeah, we do get a three oh three error, interestingly enough. But um, one thing that we can do is uh, we can try changing this and see. Oh well, maybe instead of password, it was like test one two three or something, right? We could try some things manually. Or maybe, you know, in other cases, maybe we're playing with different parameters like cookies or whatever we want to change. We were able to change that right here. Now, if we wanted to, like, maybe throw a word list on this thing, that's when we'd use the intruder. So, um, what we can do is uh, we'll have the request here, right? Now, see everything that's highlighted in green? That's all the fields it's going to try to fuzz. We want to clear that because that's not what we want. We would just want to fuzz like the password or maybe the username against the password list or something like that. Uh, or Yeah, so if we do a password spray attack, right, we could have a list of users against a single password or whatever. But in this case, we just want to say we want to fuzz this admin account uh, with a password list. We would select what we want to fuzz and then we'd hit add and then that will put these little symbols little squigglies around it hopefully you guys can see there's not really much i can do about the font here um <laughs> i don't advise watching this on mobile but uh so then what we would do you go to payloads here and this is where you'd load in your word list right here in the payload options and in this case the sniper attack would do just fine uh but you know say say we wanted this this is not a word list for uh for the situation, right? This is more SQL injection, but you get the idea. You would just go to user share word list, and, you know, wherever, you keep your word lists, and you would grab your password list, you'd load it in, and then um, you have some additional options here. But for the most part, you just go ahead and start the attack. And it'll, it'll let you know that on the community edition, you are throttled. Now, this is actually a significant issue if you have a huge uh, word list you don't really want to be using the community edition for burp for this. There's alternatives. You can use OWASP Zap. Their uh, fuzzer on, on OWASP Zap it is not throttled. Everything on Zap is free. So you could use that. Or you could use something like, you know, command line based like WFuzz. So you have a, a number of options, uh, alternatives, if you will. But uh, this is just more of a proof of concept. The way it works, basically, is it throttles you. Uh on every single request, but after a while, it exponentially throttles you. So, like, the time between each request is going to get longer and longer and longer progressively until it's, like, insanely long. So, if you are if you just have a really short word list, uh, you know, maybe something around what I have here or even shorter, and you could go ahead and use this, not a big deal, but if you're dealing with a, you know, decent size word, size word list... Uh, you, you might want to consider using one of those alternatives that I mentioned. <clears throat> but we'll just go ahead and stop here. It's more of a proof of concept for you guys. I, you won't really need to worry about the sequencer too much. Uh, the decoder can be useful. Uh, basically, you can decode stuff like if, you, if there's some like base 64 or you know URL encoded, HTML encoded. You can decode it. You can also encode stuff. So say I wanted to type... I don't know. A like say I have a query parameter. Um, this uh, file with spaces. I wanted that to be URL encoded. I can come here, encode as URL, and uh, actually enc encoded every single character. Uh, but you have some options to encode only key characters. If you do it from from here, like say, 
maybe this isn't the best uh, example here. So say you have some text here that you want to encode. <clears throat> you can convert only key characters if you want or all characters, but in the decoder, it just does it with all characters. Another cool thing is you have what is the, called the smart decode here. So if you have something and you're not sure what it's encoded in, you can do a smart decode. Let's see real quick if there's any kind of... Uh, let's see, this might be base64 right here. So what we can highlight the text and we can do send a decoder and that's automatically going to feed it in here. We can do a smart decode and it's not able to decode it, so most likely it's not yet. Oh, but it, it is base64, so sometimes the smart decoder is not able to tell, as is the case here. Because, yeah, I figured that was base64. But when I decode it as base64, uh, you see that it's simply the, the full URL, the URI here. Don't have to worry about the comparer, really. It's really good for finding access control bugs in the sequencer. I know we skipped over that. It's really good for testing randomness in uh, in your different parameters, making sure they're truly random. This be better on, like, pen tests. Not really going to help you on OSCP too much. Uh, now, the project options, uh, that's another thing that you can kind of leave things as they are. User options, uh, you probably won't have to worry about that. And this is just an extra add-on extension. You don't have to worry about... I skipped over the extender. Uh, there might be some that could be helpful for OSCP. I don't know. Maybe maybe you guys have found some. Let me know in the comments section below if you have. Uh, but, yeah, not anything that you need to worry about too much. Mainly, the most of your time is going to be spent in this proxy tab, repeater, and uh, occasionally the intruder. So I hope this video was of help to you guys. Uh, I kept it within you know, around 10 minute time frame. Uh, these are definitely the most common ways that I use Burp Suite when it comes to CTFs, OSCP, stuff like that. When it comes to on the job, that's a whole different story uh, with pen testing, especially if you're doing a lot of web app pen testing. You really got to get in the weeds with a lot of these uh, different features and functionalities that Burp has to offer. But for OSCP, you don't have to get too crazy in the weeds with it. Uh, I found this to be just fine. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about, you know, what you need to know for OSCP, definitely, uh, point the wrong way again, but definitely take a look at my series on what you need to know for OSCP uh, linked right here. And uh, yeah, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the like button as well. Helps out with the algorithms. And I will see you uh, over in that series.